name is Paul Goodlow, and I'm camera meteorologist for the Weather Channel. You can see me in the studio talking about the weather. You can see me in the field talking about the weather. In fact, I fly tonight to Boston to cover a snowstorm, so I'll be on tomorrow afternoon, 3 p.m., all through the night till about 10. So you can see what I do. And usually when I'm in Florida, it's for some pretty bad weather. So uh, I'm happy that I can come to very sunny and, what, 72 degrees South Florida on a, a non-stormy, non-hurricane day. So uh, I do appreciate the weather cooperating for my trip here. Now, because I'm outside, I, there's a couple of things that I guess I can't do with my uh, presentation here. But I'll give you the outdoor version of it. And we're celebrating Black History Month this month. And working at the Weather Channel, people always ask me, am I the only black person at the Weather Channel? And I'm, I'm not. I'm actually one of uh, four right now. But in terms of the history, I'm the fifth African-American to work on camera for the Weather Channel, third male to work at the company. And so far in our history, we've actually had 11 people at different points on TV working for the Weather Channel. And last year, the Weather Channel started a series celebrating black history and the pioneers who uh, started meteorology and, and weather and atmospheric science related sciences and fields and their contributions. And we continue that this month as well. You can see all types of uh, videos about people who have come before me and kind of paved the way to do what I do. And in fact, most people know the story of the Tuskegee Airmen, right? But there's a smaller part of that history that most people don't know. There is a group, if anyone is a pilot, you know the first thing you have to do is get a weather briefing. And there were a group of African-American meteorologists assigned to the Tuskegee Airmen who actually provided the forecast. They were trained in meteorology. They were the first black meteorologist in this country, and they were part of the Tuskegee Airmen. So there's a, a piece on the Weather Channel right now that we celebrate and kind of educate people this little known piece of black history fact that the first black meteorologist came through the Tuskegee Airmen program. Also, the very first black PhD in meteorology was a former Tuskegee weatherman. And unfortunately today, there's only been a handful of other blacks to, to earn PhDs in meteorology. You might want to question why. In fact, this is meteorology kind of considered a, uh, a non-traditional field for African Americans. In, in fact, the uh, membership in American Meteorological Society is only 2% African American. And there's a problem with that. And yes, meteorology is kind of a non-traditional program for us, but it doesn't have to be that way. In fact, typically, even when I was a kid growing up, I did well in math and science in schools. So, of course, I was kind of steered in more traditional sciences, like becoming a doctor or a dentist or an engineer. But I'm trying to steer people, steer kids into the sciences, all types of sciences, and meteorology is important because it's argued that blacks and people of color are actually on the front lines of climate change. Yes, I'm gonna talk about climate change too. <laughs> We're on the front lines of climate change because as storms get more intense, as uh, sea levels start to rise, typically we're the ones on the front lines. We're the ones living in floodplains. We're the ones living in homes that might need a little better roof on them and for whatever reason cannot afford them at that time. So we need to be more involved in things that will impact us first and more dramatically than other people. So let's talk about climate change for a quick moment. and. I'm here to say that I do not believe in climate change. That's right, I do not believe in climate change. I hope none of y'all believe in climate change. Just like I don't believe in gravity. Now you might believe the Heat will win the NBA Finals. I might believe the Atlanta Hawks will win. But again, that's a belief. Like I don't believe in gravity. Gravity, if I decide to jump off the stage, am I gonna float? No, I'm going to fall.
fall, I would probably bust my butt on the ground because I know gravity is real. It's like I don't believe in climate change. Climate change is real. Climate change is a fact, not something that has to be believed or disbelieved. It is a fact, just like the sun is going to come up tomorrow and set later on. It's a fact. So it's something that is not arguable. It is a fact. You look at everything, it is truly a fact. And a lot of people say that, no, 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 humans, mankind is too small to impact something as wonderful and large as this atmosphere, as this globe. But I beg to differ with you, because think about things. If I say, hey, you know what, I'll be your personal meteorologist here, and all you have to pay me is 10 cents. We're talking one small little dime here. I work for a whole year just for a dime. But the question is, I mean, with that dime, am I just talking about the people in this room or out here? That might be, you know, maybe 200 people, so maybe I'll get $20. Or maybe if I mean you, maybe I mean the entire city of Miramar, but 126,000 people. So if everyone gives me a dime, that's about $12,500. Not a whole lot of money. What about all of Broward County? That's 170, actually 1.7 million people giving me a dime was $170,000, not bad. South Florida, 5.7 million people, $570,000 if everyone gives a dime. The entire state of Florida, 19 and a half million people. If everyone gave me a dime, that's $1.955 million. So something as small as a dime starts to add up. So something as small as you driving a car or not recycling a can or throwing something in the trash versus, you know, cardboard and recycling bin, all that adds up to impact our environment. And if those numbers don't get you, there's quite a few of us out here, myself included, that are older than 35. I'm saying probably half the people here are older than 35. Think about when you were a kid. Think about 20, 25 years ago, you go to a beach hanging out, playing in the sand, playing in the surf. At the end of the day, you might get a little sunburn on top of your shoulders, maybe on top of your back. And there was no sunscreen back in the day. We weren't slathered on sunscreen. But what happens now? If you go out here and this sun was more intense, you're at the beach right now, no sunscreen, I give you two hours tops before you get burned. A lot of people out here might take 45 minutes before they get burned. Because we, as people, in, within our lifetime, have damaged our ozone layer and our atmosphere, which allows more harmful rays to come in and burn us more quickly. Now, again, what have we done? Have we, we, we've stopped the damage, we haven't repaired the damage, but we have learned to adapt. So the first thing you do, you take your kids to the beach, you slather them with sunscreen. It's now second nature. We don't think about back when we were kids, that was never even an issue. But again, we have changed those things in our lifetime. So if people say, oh, there's no way we can change our atmosphere, we've already done that. And small things, year after year after decade after decade, do add up. So okay, can we fix it? The simple answer is no. We cannot fix climate change. We are locked into change, which is why we have to learn how to adapt to it, how to live with it, how to change our habits to hopefully harness some of the energy from climate change to help move forward. And that's where these kids come into play, because that's where we're trying to focus the kids into getting into what they call the STEM programs, science, technology, engineering, and math. And unfortunately, as blacks and people of color, we are underrepresented in those fields. And even when we try to get in those fields, we underperform in those fields, including meteorology. So the question is why? Why do we underperform? Are we just simply not good enough? Are we not smart enough? Do we not work hard enough? Same things they talked about, the, 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 uh, the black pilots in the Tuskegee Airmen. Oh, there's no way blacks can fly planes or protect bombers. And they were outstanding in their field. So it's not that we're not good enough. It's actually something else. And I, I did some research on this. I read a book called uh, Whistling Vivaldi by Claude Steele. And it talks about something called stereotype threat. And it really opened up my eyes to, to what's going on here. Because I'm pretty sure all of us 
have known someone who was an excellent student in high school, went on to college, maybe even a valedictorian of their high school class. They go to college, they have these dreams of being in some type of science field. They go to college and they hit a wall. They change majors and they go to more liberal arts than the science field that they loved since they were a kid. And you're thinking, this is a bright person, but yet they went to college and hit a wall. Are they, just not, are they not cut out for college? The, the answer is no. Well, the answer is yes, they are cut out for college, but it's, it, it's something deeper than that. So reading this book, they were talking about uh, doing research to find out what is causing this underperformance. And they did a research, they selected male and female college students in the top scores of uh, the math and SAT, top 15%. These people, 715 and above in an 800 scale, they had A's and B's in calculus classes and they were identified as people that said math was important to them personally and professionally. Now again, there's a stereotype out there that women don't do as well as men in math. That's that's a well-known stereotype. So they tested the men. Every Men and women were tested individually, one at a time in a room. Men were tested, then women were tested, and they took a second group of women. And before they were tested, they read them this statement about the test they're about to, say, to take. They said, you may have heard that women don't do as well as men on different standardized math tests, but that's not true for this particular math test. On this specially designed test, women always do as well as men. And just hearing that statement, guess what happened? First group of women that weren't told that, they performed, they underperformed compared to the men. But the second group of women who were told those, those words performed as well as the men. So this is a well-known stereotype that women don't do as well as men as men in math, and again, there are women who excel in math, but when they're tested, because they have this subconsciously in their mind, they don't perform as well. And they repeated these same tests with blacks versus whites, and the blacks underperformed until they were told that there is no bias in this test, and they perform just as well as whites who excelled in math, like the blacks did. So it continues to say there is a burden of underperformance that people of color and blacks suffer when they really go to school. So it's not something that unfortunately people put on them, it's something subconsciously we put in ourselves, but there is a way to overcome that. And I think this is the crucial message I'm trying to get across to people is we have solutions. And they did recently, again, in this book, they were talking about solutions to combat that. And one is to have your child write a self-affirmation. Basically, you ask them, okay, what are your two or three most important values? Is it your family? Is it your church? Is it doing well on uh, your soccer, football, or basketball team? Are these things important to you? If they are, great. They're, those are your more, most important values. So write a paragraph about why these values are important to you. Do that at the beginning of the school year, and you come back, you have them do it maybe uh, every six or eight weeks or so. So it forces them to think about what's important to them and then physically write it down, which means they have to reread it, make sure it makes sense. And then they revisit it every month or two, which reinforces their goals, which actually has proven to increase their performance and some, ki some kids a 40% approval improvement of their grades just by doing these, writing these self-affirmations. It seems simple, but the shocking thing is something that simple actually works, and it helps alleviate some of that underperformance we have because it is not an intellect thing. We are just as smart, as smart or smarter than our peers, but again, it's, it's the way that our society has been set up, the way that we have been suffering for all these years it's almost a perpetuating type stereotype. But again, this is not the only solution because they also found out that the way people study impacts how they perform. Typically, even when I was growing up, 
parents said, okay, you need to buckle down, go to your room or go to the library, study, get it, get your head in the book, learn the stuff, test will be fine. And when they actually study the way different races study, African Americans tend to study more by themselves than in groups. And the other extreme is Asians. Asians spend uh, most of their time studying groups and smaller amounts of time studying by themselves. And they found that studying in groups, formal and informal, are a huge help. I and mean, this really comes into play when you talk about high school and college age kids, because it brings together more minds. So if one person doesn't perhaps understand a concept in that class, then you can have several people who can help explain it versus having to wait for the teacher or the teaching assistant and their limited office hours. You have instant feedback of, why don't you, well, I don't understand this, can you explain it to me? Sure, I can do it, but I'm at this. And you have maybe three people to give you different ways to understand that one topic. And misunderstandings about concepts can be quickly identified and corrected. And the beauty of this, and anyone who has spent time in college, one of the biggest problems is trying to find time to party as well as time to study. So doing studying in groups actually blends the whole academic and social life. Because if it's Friday night, but you're in a, a, a study session with eight or 10 other people, you can have some music on, you can still get your studying on, and also get your social, you're actually socializing with your friends. And that's the biggest pressure Okay, I have to study for four hours, then I can head to the concert, head to the party. You can do it all together, and it alleviates that pressure of, oh, I won't have a social life. You do have a social life, except now you're socializing with people in your classes, people who also want to further their career and have a good time at the same time. And, and I know from my college days, that was a big, a big hindrance of trying to manage my time that way. So again, to help alleviate the underperformance, It'll come down to self-affirmations as well as encourage your kids to start studying in groups. There's kind of safety in numbers. There's help in numbers as well. But also, because I, I want to see more kids in the STEM programs, you got to encourage your kids to get into the science, the technology, the engineering and math courses, because we need help in fighting our changing climate. Because again, we are on the front lines. So I'm hoping the next time I'm down here in South Florida, it'll be for a nice event like this and, I'm, and not weather that I tend to cover all the time. And I gotta cut my talk short because I do have a plane to catch because I do have a storm to go back into. So again, I thank you for your time and enjoy Black History Month. Let's have another nice round of applause for Mr. Paul Goodlove from the Weather Channel. And I know that you can do that with all this beautiful weather we're having here in South Florida. Because it's eight degrees. Can you imagine it's eight degrees someplace?